Gospel of John. We're going to finally make it to John chapter number 17. I've been toying with you and teasing with you about how I could not wait to get to that point because we're going to be talking about the real Lord's Prayer. And I'll explain that to you as we get going on a little bit. But this is a unique insight into the relationship with the Father and the Son and their communication and their communion with one another. The Bible speaks an awful lot about Jesus' prayer life. It uh, has numerous verses of scripture, but very seldom does it record any of his prayers. Uh, it has a lot of times where it says, and he prayed. And then sometimes it says, and after all night in prayer, he did this. And then he blessed them and break the bread and, and these kind of things. But the most lengthy of the prayers we have recorded was like over in Matthew chapter 11, verse 25. It says uh, that at that time, Jesus answered and said, I thank thee, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because thou hast hid these things from the wise and prudent and hast revealed them unto babes. And so he's even there, and that was recorded three times in the scriptures, found also in Luke and I believe also in Mark and then also in Matthew. He makes that one prayer that we're all so familiar with where he says, suffer the little children and, and forbid them not uh, to come unto me for as such is the kingdom of heaven. He makes that prayer, but it's found three times in the scripture. And then also he, uh, over in John chapter 11, when he's praying about Lazarus and the resurrection, he said, Father, I thank thee that thou hast heard me, and I know that thou hast heard me always, but because of the people which stand by, I said it, that they may believe that thou hast sent me. Now that's a key phrase because you wonder why he says certain prayers. Most of his prayer life was in secret. Most of his prayer life was just between him and the Father. But then here it says that he prayed this prayer or he said these particular words for a certain reason. And that reason was so that it would bring about a understanding of the relationship that he has with the father to the people who stood around him. And so with that thought in my mind, I've often thought, well, is that why we have all of John chapter 17, a devoted prayer? A prayer that goes into great detail about the relationship of the Father and the Son and the way he talks to the Father and the things that he anticipates in this prayer. It is an amazing, amazing prayer. And so as we start looking, I want to read one verse of scripture to you beforehand. Again, another one of his prayers found in John chapter 12. And it says in John chapter 12, verse 27, Now is my soul troubled. And what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. But for this cause came I unto this hour. Father, glorify thy name. Then came there a voice from heaven saying, I have both glorified it and will glorify it again. This was at that time when Jesus was getting ready to make the triumphal entry. This is that time just before Palm Sunday. Now, of course, we also have the discourse of his prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane. But you know what? We're not going to read that one to you because that one's going to come up in our study in the next couple of weeks. So, but even in then, he doesn't go into the words of that prayer very much. He just says one phrase, and he, the Bible even says he repeated that phrase three times. That that's what was on his heart. That was what was on his mind. And so we will all keep all that. And let me go ahead and plant a seed of thought with you. Has Jesus ever prayed a prayer that didn't get answered? Keep that in mind as we get ready one day soon to make it over to the Garden of Gethsemane prayer where he prays that the cup would pass from him. And we'll talk in great detail about what that cup is. But as we start looking at this prayer, there's no record of any full length prayer that Jesus prayed except for this one. All the other ones, the words are not recorded for us. We don't know what went on. So as we get ready, I know many times when I go to prayer, I'll take a list with me. And, uh, you know, the Bible does say you can watch and pray. So it's okay to open your eyes and read your prayer list. And uh, we have a prayer list. And so my question to you is, what was on Jesus' prayer list when he began to pray this prayer in John chapter 17? Well, by way of introduction, again, I'm not going to read any verses to you just yet. But in John chapter number 17, one of the things that he prays for is found in verses 1 through 5. He prays for himself. But what he's praying about is his glory. And that's all we're going to cover tonight, by the way. But also you're going to see, he says, in that second set of verses, verses 6 through 19, his prayer request and his prayer list consists of his disciples. He's going to make a prayer for those who are following him right then and the, the, the ministry that they're going to have. And then in verses 20 through 26, this is the one that amazes me most. He prays for those who are going to believe one day. Do you realize who that is? Jesus in John chapter 17 prayed for himself and his glory. He prayed for his disciples and their ministry. And then he prayed for you and I. He prayed for us at that same time. 
Just before going to the cross, the Lord really did have us on his mind. And he prayed up to the Father on our behalf. Now, I know what some of you are thinking when I said, we're going to talk about the real Lord's Prayer. And I know some of you immediately go, well, I know the Lord's Prayer. And you start off by going, okay, uh, what about that other one then? What about Matthew 6 where he says, uh, after this manner, therefore pray ye, our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. On earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation. But deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And you and I look at that and we go. That's the Lord's prayer. Well that's what we named it. That's what mankind came along and made it. But if you'll even just examine it. You'll see several things about it. This is not a prayer. You ready for this? That Jesus could have ever prayed. He said, by the way, after this manner, meaning here's your example. Here's an outline of prayer. Here's an example of how to pray. He is not saying this is your prayer. Now, I know some people who look at that, and there's a lot of denominations today who say, well, we all have to pray the Lord's Prayer. Let's pray the Lord's Prayer. Okay. Our Father. And, and there's nothing wrong with that. You're praying Scripture. That's fine with me. You know, as long as you understand it, you know you're, what you're saying, and you mean it that way, that's fine. That's not a forbidden thing to do. But what he is saying here is, after this manner, therefore pray who? You. Ye pray this way. Here's how you should pray. This is not how he should pray. And the reason I know that is because of Matthew chapter 6, verse 12. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And Luke 11, verse 4, the first part. And forgive us our sins. Wait a minute. You mean to tell me Jesus Christ had to say, here's my prayer, Father. Forgive me of my debts. Forgive me of my sins then we are in some serious, serious trouble. Go ahead and turn off the TV, forget everything, because this is all in vain. If Jesus Christ had to ask for forgiveness of his sin, that means he's not the Savior. That means he's just another sinner. If Jesus Christ then would fall into those one of those three categories that we like to put Jesus in, and this is a true statement, by the way, either Jesus Christ is who he said he is or he's who he said he wasn't, then he's not that. So what you have to understand is there's only three things. I heard a preacher say this a long time ago. Pretty good outline, by the way. He's either a liar, a lunatic, or Lord. Because everything he said and everything he taught, he's either lying to you about it or it's true. He's either a crazy man, a lunatic, because he thinks he's the son of God. Or he's Lord. And so when Jesus Christ died on the cross for my sin, he died for my sin, not our sin as mine and his, but all of our sins as in everybody but himself. He that knew no sin became sin for us. So please understand that the prayer that we look at as the Lord's Prayer really is the model prayer. And you can go through there and it gives you some great ideas of how to outline your own personal prayer life. But in this, the real Lord's Prayer, he begins in verses 1 through 5, and that's all we're going to read at tonight. Verses 1 through 5, he's going to share with us what he is going to pray about himself. By the way, there's nothing wrong with praying for yourself. And so listen to what he says. Let's read it together. John chapter 17, verse number 1. These words spake Jesus and lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour is come. Glorify thy son that thy son also may glorify thee. As thou hast given him power over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as thou hast given him. And this is eternal life, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. I have glorified thee on the earth. I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. And now, O Father, glorify thou me with thine own self, with the glory which I had with thee before the world was now as we start looking at this we're going to run across and by the way don't get antsy at first because I'm, I'm going to go almost by word by word you're going to think we'll never get through this yes we will i promise in verse number one as he speaks he says these words spake jesus john writes this under the inspiration of the holy spirit it's just a reference to say this is the concluding remarks and these words spake jesus now this is in reference to Matt, uh, john chapter 13 14 15 16 uh, all of those things have happened now. And these words spake Jesus. He had finished it. It was done. 
All the table talk. Remember all the talk we've discussed in previous lessons and messages about everything that went on around that table that night? All the promises that were made. All the prophecies that were made. All the convicting statements that were made. All the blessings that were given. All of those conversations. He said, he spake all these things. And then about the walk talk. Remember, that was when they were on the walk on the way to the Garden of Gethsemane. And as they came through the vineyards and they looked and he said, Hey, I am the true vine and you are the branches in, in chapter number 15. He said all of these things. He's given so much wisdom and so much instruction and so much insight to them. But now something's got to happen. Along with all those things said and all those things done. Now the Son of Man, the Son of God, the Messiah has come. Listen to me. As far as he earthly can with the plan of God. What he's now saying is, Father, you have to exercise sovereignty at this point. I'm giving it to you now. When I have accomplished all that you've given me to do, the rest, Father, is going to be hindering upon your sovereign will and your sovereign power. Because remember, even in the Garden of Gethsemane, in just a little while, he's going to be praying as it were, great drops of blood sweating, sweating from his body. And he says what? Not my will, but thine be done. He's asking the Father to do something here. And one of those things he's asking is, it has reference to his glory. And he's asking God to take over. What a lesson that is for you and I. That we can do all that we can do in the ministry. We can work as hard as we want for the kingdom of God's sake. We can promote, we can train, we can preach, we can minister, we can help, we can counsel, we can evangelize. But listen, nothing happens with all of those efforts unless... God the Father wills it. And unless we bathe it in prayer. No wonder the, the uh, disciples, the apostles said that they were not going to give themselves to serving tables. But to what? Preaching and praying. It's a, a crucial part of understanding the ministry and what it's all about. We have to work as though God wasn't going to bless. I know that sounds crazy. But then we have to trust God as if our works are no good and everything depends on Him. And it does. And so what I want you to understand is Jesus comes to the end of the earthly ministry. And as the end of that earthly ministry comes, he is not only sowing truth, he's not just watering truth, he's praying that God would give the increase. That the blessings that are going to flow from all that he's done, all the things he's promised, all that's going to happen, all is going to be dependent upon the Father's reaction to what takes place in the next few hours. What's it going to do? Remember the Bible said that it had to satisfy God's wrath. It has to satisfy God's justice. It has to satisfy and appease God. But remember, we also read in the scripture where it says, and it pleased the Father to bruise him, meaning it satisfied the requirements. But notice what it's, what's the next phrase says, and he lifted up his eyes to heaven. That is not a, an arrogance, by the way. Some people said you always have to bow your head and close your eyes. No, you don't. We do that to try to get away from distractions. Things that are around us. But it would do us good sometimes to just lift our eyes to heaven. And while we're talking to our Heavenly Father, just be astonished with the creation that's there. Just to look up. I love, I, I've said it and it's kind of got like a catchy little phrase around here. That when we look up into the heavens, the Bible just puts it in like a half paragraph sentence. It just goes, and he made stars. Look at the galaxy and all of that. God just kind of threw that in as a by statement of his creation. Oh, and by the way, he made some stars. Oh, did he ever make some stars? But the Lord looks up into heaven. And as he looks up into heaven, the very first word he says, after he spake all these things, the promises are made. It's now, I got to talk to daddy about this. And the first words out of his mouth is father. Father. With all the agony that he knows he's fixing to go through. With the discouragement that he's obviously already had and faced with the disciples. And the rejection already that night. And the coming true of the, the prophecy about Judas. And he's looking and he knows and he says, Father. In fact, in this prayer he says, Father, in verse number 5, verse 11, verse 21, verse 24, verse 25. Do you realize that every time in the scripture... That Jesus addressed or had a communication in prayer or however we want to call it or refer to it. In his conversation with the Father, every single time he refers to him as Father except once. And that one time took place on the cross. It happened in Matthew chapter 27 verse number 46. And it says at about the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. That is to say, my God, my God. Why hast thou forsaken me? 
And when we get into the study a little bit further into the, the crucifixion, we'll understand what was going on. But that's when God the Father could not look at the sin of the Son. The Son becoming sin. He, the Son, He that knew no sin, became sin's offering for you and I. And so how many times do we read in the scripture that His Father, His Father, His Father. And then it really hit me, and I, I share with our folks all the time. And I hope they didn't get tired of hearing it. But do you realize that the Lord made you and I a promise that he couldn't be promised to his own son. That I'll never leave thee. Nor forsake thee. And yet here on the cross. Because of my sin. And the darkest hour in the history. My God my God. Why hast thou forsaken me. And then after he says. That phrase or to the father. He begins to announce to the father. Something obviously the father already knows. He says the hour. Is come. The first words after the Father were, we're here. This is what it's all about. The Bible, again, I've shared with you, has uh, the Lord Jesus Christ was slain before the foundation of the world. The plan was made all in eternity past with God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit coming to an agreement on the plan of God. And guess what? The hour has now come. How many times do we read in the gospel accounts where Jesus himself would say, my hour has not yet come? My hour has not yet come. Even when his first miracle was done. And it's, it's, it, it shows something about the preciseness and the predestination of God in redemptive history. All the things that God has portrayed and prophesied about the Lord Jesus Christ. How he gave certain a certain number of days and weeks. And you can put all those things together and see, man, how can it be so perfect? Because it's from God. But even in the showing of the first miracle, Mary comes to him in John chapter 2 verse 4. Jesus said unto her, woman... What have I to do with thee? My hour is not yet come. And then just a few minutes later, guess what he does? He does the miracle she asked for, basically. Lord, they're out, you know, son, they're out of wine. Well, okay, that's fine. And so he, what are you going to do something? He does do something about it. He turns water into wine. But notice he waits for the precise exact moment of when he's supposed to do that. In John chapter 6, verse uh, or 7, verse number 6, Jesus said unto them, My time is not yet come, but your time is is all the way ready. John chapter 7 verse 8. Go ye up into the feast. I go not up yet to the feast. For my time is not yet full come. And then just a few hours later. Guess what he does? He leaves and goes to the feast. He is operating on the perfect plan. Of almighty God the Father. And so in John chapter 7 verse 30. He says. Then they sought to take him. <laughs> but no man laid hands on him. Because his hour was not yet come. They did the same thing in chapter 8, verse number 20. These words spake Jesus in the treasury as he taught in the temple. And no man laid hands on him, for his hour was not yet come. On occasion when they sought to kill him, or on occasion when they sought to take him by force to make him king, they couldn't do it. They didn't lay a hand on him. The Bible said he had passed through their midst. Why? Because his hour was not yet come. The events in redemption history are predetermined and predestined and appointed by Almighty God. And so Jesus is announcing to the Father, He knows, as the Messiah, as the incarnate, robed in human flesh, Son of Almighty God, it's time. It's time now for history. What hour is it? What time is it on God's time clock? What time is it in His story? Because He is all of history. All of history cruxes on the Lord Jesus Christ. All history, even time and dates are set by what? The birth and the death of the Lord Jesus Christ. The turning point in history is now here. Everything is going to change. The events of all the ages is getting ready to happen. The crossroads of where two eternities will now come to meet will be standing there on Calvary. The hour which the Son of Man and the Son of God will come to an end. The humiliation and the humbling of himself will stop. He will terminate all the labors that he has done down here on the earth to prepare man for sin and salvation. His suffering will increase. But guess what? He is going to, in just a few hours, remove the entire Levitical sacrificial system. He will become the final sacrifice. The hour has come. What is it, the hour? The hour of all the Old Testament prophecies. 
The hour of all the Old Testament types and shadows. The hour of all the Old Testament symbols and pictures. The hour that every prophet spoke of. The hour that the Son of Man longed to be part of. The hour of salvation has come. The hour of triumph over sin. The hour of triumph over judgment. The, the hour of triumph of the wrath of God. The hour of the triumph of the prince of the power of the air. The hour of dismissing the old covenant and starting a new covenant. That's the hour that's now come. It's now time to do this thing. Here it is. And he knew exactly what hour it was. Remember what he, I read to you a few moments ago in John chapter 12? In John chapter 12, and verse number 23, it says, And he said, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. You and I have no clue what he meant by that. We look at that and we hear him say something like that. And you wait a minute. I thought it was the hour where the Son of Man was going to be crucified, not glorified. Yeah. The crucifixion was his glorification. We'll see that in just a second. And just at that time of that triumphal entry, he also makes this statement in John chapter 12 and verse 27. And I read this a few moments ago. Now is my soul troubled. And what can I say? Now listen to this prayer very carefully because it's going to tie in in a couple of weeks when we get over to the Garden of Gethsemane prayer. Now is my soul troubled. And what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. But for this cause came I unto this hour. Let that sink in. Think about what he just said. And then verse 28. Father, glorify thy name. Then came there a voice from heaven saying, I have both glorified it and will glorify it again. Now remember, what's he asking for? In that verse, he's asking for the Father's name to be glorified. Not his own glory yet. He asked for that in chapter number 17 where we're fixing to read. What happened? He has begun to anticipate the horror of sin. He's anticipating the separation from God the Father. That's this hour. But in the midst of this hour of what we would see humiliation and agony and suffering and bloodshed and horror, he says, hey, you know what? This is glory time. <laughs> this is the glory hour we're fixing to have. This is the all in all. This is the everything. This is what we've been waiting for. This is the comment. This is the coup de gras, man. This is everything that's supposed to happen. This is the hour of glory. The hour of glory? Glory that is going to blot out the curse of sin. Glory that is going to reconcile sinners to God. It was that hour that the sun refuses to shine. It's that hour that the earth is going to rock and the, our earth is going to reel and it's going to quake. It's the hour that the veil is going to be torn. It is the hour that the graves are going to open and spit out the people who are in them that are believers. It was glory's hour. And the reason why it was the glory's hour is because Jesus asked for it. Here's what he asked. He said in verse number five, the first part, and now, O Father, glorify thou me. Glorify thou me. You know what that means? Put glory on display. Put it on me right now. Let the earth understand the glory of God. Remember verse number one of the verses we just read to you? These words spake Jesus and lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. What? Glorify thy son. And here's the purpose. That thy son also may glorify thee. Man, there's a whole lot of glory going on over there, isn't there? Let the Son glorify the Father, but Father, you've got to glorify me. What does he say? The events that are fixing to happen are going to display the glory of God. Glorify me. When? when? Well, glorify me. What's fixing to happen? The cross is going to happen. The resurrection is going to happen. The ascension is going to happen. The coronation of King of Kings and Lord of Lords and High Priest is getting ready to happen. What is Jesus saying? Glorify thou me. Let me glorify you. Let me be a reflection back on you. But Father, glorify me. Let the earth see the glory of God in these events that are fixing to happen. Lord, let it be so. Put my majesty on display. He's praying that the Father would accomplish His will through all the works that Jesus has done. Glorify me so I can glorify you. Glorify the work that I've done and the work I'm going to do on the cross. Glorify me by helping me through the cross and finishing me to bear sin. Help me through the grave and resurrection power. Move me already to sit on the right hand of God the Father. You know what? That is not a selfish prayer. 
Because of the, what, the reason he prayed it. Glorify thy son. Why? So I can glorify you. I wonder sometimes when we pray prayers that are asking for God to do something special and miraculous in our lives. Do we really look for it because I want this for what? Is it really so that I can glorify God and that it's for the benefit of other people? Glorify thy son so that I can bring glory to you. Remember, he's already taught that possibility in, in John chapter number five when he said, whosoever honors the son honors the father and whosoever honors the father honors the son. If you glorify the son, you glorify the father. If you honor the father, you honor, it's all the same. You know why? Because they're the same. The father and son are one. The son is going to reflect the father's glory from the cross to the crown. Not necessarily the crown of thorns, but the crown that the Lord is going to wear. When we crown him with many diadems, the Bible says. What does all that mean? What does it mean to show God's glory? How does God display his glory? He displays it by his attributes. And that's a fancy word for saying who God is. What God is. And I don't, don't take that phrase, what God is, but more the characteristics of God. How do we know? How, how do we see God's glory? How do we see it on the cross? We saw it on the cross and we see it in the resurrection and we see it in the ascension and we see it in the coronation. How do we see it? We see the love of God. Have, is there any clearer picture of the love of God than the cross, the tomb, the resurrection, the ascension, the crowning him king of kings and lord of lords and saying one day he's going to return and set up his kingdom here for a millennial reign and then for all of eternity he shall reign. Is there any greater love than that? And he says, I give my son so you can join us for that. Is there any greater show of God's mercy than the cross? You say, well, that didn't look like much mercy for me. It was all mercy for us. The grace of God is glorified. The power of God is seen. The righteousness of God is seen. The holiness of God. The goodness of God. The grace of God. The wrath of God. The justice of God. The judgment of God. The wisdom of God. The knowledge of God. Figure out any other attribute you want. Hang it right there on the cross. And you see God in all of his glory. Because all of God's attributes are seen right there. And he placed them on the Son. So that the Son could glorify the Father. He says glorify thine. And unleash it. Lord show it to me. Let them see it. And then I. We have to ask the question, okay, how do you do that then? If Jesus said, glorify my son, and he says, I have both glorified him and will glorify again. Well, did he? Uh, prior to the resurrection, did he? During the crucifixion, did he? In the burial, did he? What did he do that displayed and will display to you and I the glory of God the Son and God the Father? Look at verse 2. As thou hast given him power over all flesh, that he should give, did you catch that word? Give eternal life to as many as had thou hast given him. Verse number eight, uh, three. And this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. The first manifestation of the glory of God is the fact that it comes in the death of Christ for eternal life. Eternal life that we can have a gift from God. Oh my goodness, what a gift. Aren't you glad? I'm so glad I can't earn it. I'm so glad that there's no impossibility for me to do it. But the greatest gift that God ever gave man was not the gift of life when we became living and breathing souls. It was the gift of eternal life that comes only through the Lord Jesus Christ. Remember something about eternal life. We kind of look at it. We kind of get a little misunderstanding about it. It's not talking about duration. He's not talking about eternal life as in the time span of life. It's a type of life. It's an eternal life, like God's life. God has eternal, everlasting life. And he presents that to us. Remember the Bible says, he that hath the Son hath life, and he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. Do you understand? When I get salvation, when I get eternal life, I actually do not get a product. I get a person from God. I get God himself. And in his glory is seen in the fact that he can take a hell-bound, hell-deserving, worthless sinner like you and I and give us the process of how we can get saved by the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we can come to know Christ as our Savior. And we can come to know God as the only true God. Now, man, that upsets a lot of folks. When they start talking about tolerance and putting up with, listen, there's only one God. 
There's only one true God. And if you know him, you will also know Jesus Christ. You will know him and who the fullest sense. He knows Jesus who is sent by him. That word know in the scriptures is talking about an intimate relationship. It is even in reference to the intimate relationship of a husband and a wife. And Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she bare. You catch that? It's that intimacy of a, that God placed in the marriage relationship of the husband and wife relationship where they become one. He says, and the two become one. That's what he's saying. When we know Christ. Remember when Christ said that he would tell some folks, depart from me, ye workers of iniquity. I never knew you. Do you think he didn't have a head knowledge of them? He had never had an intimate, personal, one becoming, one flesh, or one spirit relationship. You see, when I had eternal life, I had a new type of life. Not a duration. It will last for all of eternity. But it's a life that is an eternal one of completeness, an eternal one of unlimitedness, an eternal one of intimate love and relationship and fellowship. And you want to see the glory of God? Look at Jesus on the cross dying for sinners because God loves them. The second thing is, it's found and shown by an accomplished labor. How did Jesus show the glory of God? He showed it by giving himself on the cross. But also, what does it say in verse number four? I have glorified thee on the earth. I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. <laughs> Jesus came to do the work of the Father. Jesus came to do the will of the Father. And in this portion of scripture, those verses I just read to you, did you notice the past tense for a future event? It's like Jesus has already accomplished it and he's looking back. This is like he's sitting on the throne of God going, hey, daddy, remember when I did this? I have glorified thee on the earth. I have what? Finished the work which thou hast been, that thou gavest me to do. The cross is speaking of and the death and the resurrection and all those are spoken of in past tense. I've finished the work you've given me to do. Remember in the Garden of Gethsemane again. What did he pray? Not my will, but thine be done. There was total obedience to the Father. I've come to do the work you gave me. I've finished what you've given me. I've done it perfectly. I've done it in obedience. And right down to the very last phrase on the cross. What did he say I did? It is finished. Do you realize the life of Christ and giving of his life was the completed work, the labors that he had done? From birth to death, he lived a perfect life. He lived in perfect righteousness. He lived in perfect submission. He was in complete obedience. The Bible says he humbled himself even to the death of the cross. So how can I see God's glory? I see God's glory in the absolute love of God in eternal life for me and for you. I see the glory of God in the accomplished work that Jesus did. Mission accomplished. But also see it when he asked for acceptance of his lordship. What does he say? And now, and now, O oh Father, glorify thou me with thine own self, with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. The cross was glory. It provided eternal life. The cross demonstrated perfect obedience. The cross showed those things. And then thirdly, it is his return back to the Father. I, I want to come back to you and I want to have that acceptance. I want to know my work accomplished what it did. Jesus said, I have the power to lay down my life. I have the power to take it again. No man will But do you understand something? He was waiting for the Father to say, I accept it. As the high priest, I accept your blood as the offering for the souls of mankind. It was a vindication. It was a verification. It was an acceptance. It was a, Father, I want you to say, yes, the work is complete and I'll provide eternal life for sinners. Yes, I've offered you complete obedience and now I've accomplished my labors. And now, Lord, yes, would you say you have accepted me and I can come home and you and I can have that perfect glorified relationship that you and I used to have? It's, there's an old hymn that we sing oftentimes written by Jesse Pounds uh, and it's referred to as the way of the cross leads home, right? He says in that first verse, I must needs go home by the way of the cross. There's no other way but this. I shall ne'er get sight of the gates of light if the way of the cross I miss. Do you realize for the sinner, if I don't go by the way of the cross, I cannot be present with God the Father. And guess what? Jesus said the same thing. If I don't go to the cross... And complete the labor with the Father gave me to do. I and the Father will not be together again. I've got to finish the work. Listen, for the Jesus, the way of the cross leads home for him. 
So that he could have the glory that he and the Father had before the foundation of the world. The way of the cross leads home for the Son of God because it becomes the end of the Son of Man. He doesn't have to be the sent Messiah anymore. You see, mission accomplished. Father has accepted. Satan is defeated. Sin destroyed. Salvation provided. All of those things take place. And you know something else? He said, I want you to give me the glory that I had with you before. You see, some folks have this hierarchy, right, 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 relational idea that Jesus has a little bit of glory and Father has this much glory and the Holy Spirit. Listen, Jesus didn't ask for more glory. You know why? He can't get any more glory. <laughs> Him and God the Father and God the Holy Spirit have all the glory there is. He limited himself when he robed himself in human flesh. But he's asking to be restored back to that divine essence of, of approval and acceptance with God the Father that they could be fully glorious together. There are no degrees of being God. One is not lesser God than the other. And therefore, there's no lesser glory for the one than the other. He has answered the call. And the prayer was answered because he died. But he rose again. He ascended and he was crowned. And I can almost imagine the scene of heaven. It's written by the Apostle Paul in the book of Philippians chapter 2. As the Lord Jesus Christ enters into the heavens, walks into the holy place, goes into the holy of holies, takes his own blood, sprinkles it on the altar, and the Father says, that's good enough for me, I accept you, and I'll accept everybody who accepts that. And it says, and Paul kind of under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, jotted these words down, wherefore God also hath highly exalted him, and given him a name which is above every name. That at the name of Jesus every knee should bow. And of that things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth. And that the, every tongue should confess. Listen. That Jesus Christ is Lord for what? To the glory of God the Father. What he's going to do on the cross will glorify the Father. So Father, put it on me right now. Not just the sin of the world, but the glory of heaven. Did Jesus ever pray a prayer that didn't get answered? <laughs> Not a chance. Let's pray. Father, tonight as we just pause for a moment and think of the awesomeness of the relationship that God wants to have with us sinners. Lord, he has even prayed for us 2,000 years ago. As he was preparing to die on the cross, he was thinking about us who would one day be saved and he prayed for us. Father, let us bring glory to his holy name. Let us realize that the glory of God is seen in the crucifixion of Jesus. Let every person who has heard this message and has heard the gospel understand that without the Lord Jesus Christ, Lord, we're, we're sinners and that sin separates us from you. And because of what Jesus just prayed about going to the cross, he can bring many sons to glory. Father, that we could accept him as our personal Savior. Lord, help us at this very moment to look into our hearts and make sure we have that relationship squared away. And then, Father, as we live in this world with all of its craziness and all of its sinfulness, Lord, let us ask you, let us reflect your glory. Let the people in this community and around the world see in us, not just these immediate believers here, but believers all around the globe, Father, that we will let our light shine for Christ, that we will magnify the glory of God, showing us, Lord, your Shekinah glory. Let the glow of God be in our faces for your kingdom's sake. For it's in Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. God bless you. I love you.